to our sort of overall discussion, and we have several identified topics and that will occupy us for the rest of the afternoon. So thank you very much for inviting me here. This is the closest place ever I gave a talk in my life. So it's always good to have me back here at the INT Institute for Nuclear Theory as an experimentalist. You know, you always look the dumbest one in the room. <laughs> All right, so I will talk, as I say, like about our previous experience that we had or the studies that we did uh, for uh, measuring, for extracting GPDs, auto measuring DVCS with an EAC, what we did, and what is actually left in the future to do, and what we learned from the past. So I kind of like focus on these grounds. Uh, we have discussed this many times today, so just to set the stage, we can consider exclusive processes to, of course, extract GPDs, and DVCS is rightfully so-called the uh, golden plate you know, process because you can, uh, by varying Q-square, scanning in Q-square, uh, access by evolution both quarks and gluons, and you don't have complications uh, due to the lack of knowledge of vector methods uh, wave functions. Uh, nevertheless, it's really, really important also to mention, and we discussed several times today, the Mason's production. Because here, yes, you have an uncertainty on the wave function, but you can, with light mesons, in, uh, for instance, separate the quark flavors. And uh, with the JPSI, which is a higher mass meson produced in CC bar and quark gluon, gluon, gluon fusion, uh, can access directly the, the, the gluons. So this is a very powerful mechanism combined with VCS too. So all of this, we want to evaluate how well EAC can do and what is the impact. And also, the alternative way that was discussed today is that we uh, measure DVCS, but also on a neutron. Of course, on a collider, you don't accelerate neutrons, so you can accelerate polarized deuterium <coughs> or eventually helium-3 and do the same stuff for uh, actually uh, separate the flavors. And this is actually interesting to do in parallel with the metal meson production. All right. Couple of words about the observables that we have to measure. So experimentally, we need a machine now that measures with precision all set of observables we need. So the differential cross-section is one that has been discussed extensively today. And another very powerful one at TIC will be that couldn't be possible at Hera to polarize transversely the proton beam and then measure the AUT asymmetry, which gives you access to GPDE and opens the window to the spin decomposition of the proton through the GSM rule, as we know. Hera actually measured uh, the, at least one measurement there is of charge asymmetry because we had electrons and positrons at Hera. There was, uh, this is actually a nice way to access the real part of the scattering amplitude as we discussed. There was a time that we discussed that the AC of having positrons too. This discussion at certain point ended, so, but I just leave it uh, as a note there. So what can we learn from the past? So the only collider that we had that collided electrons and protons is Hera. So Hera collected this half uh, Fentoburn per collider experiment. So if you combine data together, it's one inverse Fentoburn of data. In 15 years, so actually the main difference will be luminosity if you compare her with an EAC. Uh, Hera had a <coughs> larger center of mass energy, but it was a very a less flexible machine, let's say. So we run basically most of the time at the same energy or so or similar. Uh, the detectors uh, used at the collider H1 and Zeus were not optimized for doing exclusive diffraction in the first place. So we had to adapt. And, uh, and learn from the experience. This is something that we learn at the EAC. So we want optimized detector that we can control systematics very well. There was a fixed target experiment, Hermes, that could polarize the target. And so we measure like DVCS at, uh, let's say, at a larger center of mass energy, uh, lower center of mass energy, so larger X, uh, but with polarized target two, and measure spin asymmetries. So, if we uh, compare, if we move on for what, from what we learned from Hera, for instance, we learned very well how to do a DVCS analysis at Hera in a collider mode. So uh, we need, when we uh, measure the differential cross-section as a function of T, 
certainly to have an exclusive measurement. So we ideally want to measure everything we have. We have the electron, we have the positron, we have the proton that not, was not always possible to measure at Hera, but there were uh, later on added some Roman pots in the forward region that could catch and measure the form momentum of this guy going forward through the beam pipe. So what is the strategy that Hakera was developed to minimize the, the, the contribution from the background, which is something that you want to remove in the cross-section? Now, beta Heitler is a well-known process in QED, so easy to subtract, but well-known to a certain extent, which is kind of 2% uh, systematics due to the lack of uh, knowledge of a proton from form factor mainly. So, uh, the way to actually minimize the sample of beta hydrogen that otherwise would be overwhelming is to look at the topology of the two electromagnetic cluster. So we say that uh, if the more backward one is the electron, then this is a sample that contains both DVCS and uh, beta hydrogen in a similar proportion. It depends on the energy too. But if, he, uh, if the photon is the one that goes more backward, backward than the other, uh, then this sample is completely dominated by beta hydrogen, plus some other source of background that can be the electron, J psi, that can be easily estimated. Terra, for example, asking that the charge of the lepton is not the same as the beam particle, so it was what we call the wrong sign sample. And then you do a subtraction of one to the other until you clean your sample, you have a clean DVCS. This is basically a technique that we now consider in our studies for the EAC2. Here is the region where Hera did their measurements, uh, in Q square basically between 1.5 and 100 GV square, and W between uh, 40 and 170 GV. So, <coughs> yes. Just, just one question. What, what do you mean by cleaning the sample? Yeah, do you have two processes that interfere at the amplitude level? So this is oh, so yeah. like one is a physical, uh, one is like a, an experimental background to the other. They really. Like so when you measure the cross section, actually, you are interested on, the, on counting the events, right? So you subtract. My, yeah, my question is, maybe that in certain kinematic points, one amplitude is much larger than the other. So is that what you mean? But I'm saying, no, no, no. I mean, you have you have in the end you have in the end your sample of events, and you don't know if it's a DVCS or a beta Eichler. You count the the, the 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 events number, right? So that. The you question use is even pointless because it's too interfering amplitude. So uh, yeah. you cannot oh. say whether it's you cannot. It's a sum of amplitudes. No, so no, I think you're saying just trying to minimize the. Yeah. So yeah. one one is to minimize, and then in the end, when you measure the DVCS cross section, you need the counts of the DVCS that so you can estimate by subtracting, for example, a Monte Carlo simulated sample. Do you really want to go to a, a kinematics where? In, among the interfering amplitudes, the DVCS amplitude is dominant. So what we did at Terra is the same uh, phase space. So we didn't have a, a region, a corner of the phase space where you have the beta Heitler and then you and then you normalize there and then you subtract somewhere else. So what you have is this interval in the kinematic region, and you want to estimate in your sample how much can be from beta Heitler. Of course, you don't know event by event what is it, but what you know is that you can subtract statistically. So it's called a statistical subtraction of one to another until you have the, est the correct estimate I mean, for being. What you can compare is the, the total results, say DVCS and beta hydra interfering, and maybe a hypothetical result where you have only beta hydra there. But Otherwise, there's no. So that's that's the. This is this is the this is the this, this, is, the, this is the place where you have basically all beta, all beta Eichler, right? So once you normalize to this, you can statistically subtract to your sample, which is with this with this topology, and then you you have a DVCS cross section. This is how we measure cross section. If you measure asymmetries, this is pointless because you can you can you you are interested in the interference, right? But if you measure the DVCS differential cross section, you need to, to measure it for the DVCS process, right? So that, that is basically how it's every every HERA paper that you compare is done uh, by this uh, subtraction or the background statistics. It's a common procedure that you do experimentally. So that's the only way you can measure. Yeah. So it's experimental. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
And you can you can like because sensor is probably much more maybe tried to or to isolate regions in some cases where maybe you have a more favorable ratio, but that you always measure that. Yes. So uh, basically, this is actually okay. A couple of words also about the, the, the leading spectrometers that we use at Terra. One experiment, Zeus, had it operational at Terra. One actually is the only experiment that is the DVCS measurement with the Roman port. So tagging directly the proton in the final state and measuring the proton momentum. Uh, then that experiment had to remove the Roman pots in Hera 2 because they changed the magnet configuration and the, the, this spectrometer couldn't be there anymore. There was no space. Uh, but one, one, this is already telling you the difference with an EAC. So at Hera, when you use this, uh, this spectrometer, only you could use a sample of 31 inverse picobar. And this spectrometer was far away from her 100% acceptance. This had like a matter of 3, 4% acceptance. So the statistics was ridiculous, and this is the, it, the measurement with the uh, Roman pots that Zeus could do at low Q squared. This is the B slope, so it's a slope for the T differential cross section. Compared to uh, measurements from H1, always of the DVCS, but in this case, uh, the T was reconstructed out of momentum conservation. So there are some systematics that are more relevant in this point. Uh, this is a collection that actually you can see in many of the Hera talks where you, you see these beautiful measurements of all the methods together with the DVCS. This is again the B slope, the slope of the differential cross section in T. Uh, you can see that you can see this nice transition from the soft to the hard regime when you have the, the, the slope goes from basically 12 or 11 uh, and goes to level at 4.5. And everything looks within these uncertainties, at least the universal. It's not clear actually how it looks for the DVCS. Daria today showed like the, the, the plot where you also have the bislot from Compass. And it looks, uh, it's in another phase space. Well, okay, it looks like compatible with this, but you want to see what trend, for instance, has uh, evolving in Q square. And this is a leftover from here and within the uncertainties, you cannot say. So what is the advantage now of the AC? Certainly you will have a, like a very flexible machine compared to her, and we all know this. And in our case, the advantage is that mainly is the luminosity. So we can do fine beams and we can polarize uh, the protons and the electron together. So we can have fine beaming and in this fine beaming have both a precise measurement of the T differential cross section and of the spin asymmetries, particularly the AUT. And we we'll want to uh, design properly the detectors from, from day one, of course. So uh, here is again the phase uh, space coverage of an EAC. This plot is a little outdated. And so you have actually a, an overlap with the JLAP 12. And EAC uh, will be like, once you extend to the full energy scale, you can, you, you can actually connect the region uh, from uh, where you measure it at the fixed target experiments down to Hera. So this is kind of, it, 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 you can do this in this mapping of the phase space very, in, a, in a very fine beginning. So again, this is a machine that will, in the end, challenge the theory because you will have to evolve to, 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 to develop a model which is able not to just describe or do imaging at large or low X, but describe all the transition in between. So I guess it, it will be challenging, and, and this is what ESC will buy us. What's, what's the minimum why? Uh, point oh 0.01, and, uh, and then the maximum that here we consider it's 0.6 in this plot. The yeah, elasticity. Yeah, no problems with resolution or so forth. It depends then on which detector you, you, you consider, right? But yeah, point, point oh 0.01 to point oh 0.03, this is the, 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 the lower limit of the designs that we are considering right now. Uh, so what actually we did, and I remember we did back in time with Creso, Dieter, Elke, and so on, um, published in this paper here, and later ended up in the white paper. So how can we assess an impact of, um, of the AC on uh, constraining the, the, the GPDs with DVCS alone? So we did a, a study where we did the mock analysis a la Hera, so we did all this, uh, the same kind of analysis cuts and also 
the way of uh, rejecting or uh, reducing the beta height to the ground. We kind of evaluated what kind of uh, radiative effect we, we can expect. We assume, it, we assume also the uh, detector acceptance that at that time was a model detector of BNL, but basically it's a similar acceptance in, uh, in the detectors that we are considering right now. Uh, we consider the resolution from a typical Roman pot spectrometer, and then we bin three times that, and it's still a fine binning. And we assume a, a slope at the time of 5.6, which is compatible with what H1 show, uh, measured. Uh, so, and then we assume also systematics, which it's a benchmark, it's a ballpark of 5%. It's really a ballpark. At Hera was around seven or so. So you can set a goal, like we can learn something from that. And, and let's assume 5%, it's really a ballpark. Uh, I have curiosity just because you know. Yes. So uh, about the relative projection, yes. Because I know that at JF sometimes I have a collection not I, I, I can show, I will come with some slides and we can discuss about that because, yeah. Uh, so again, this is, I said, we want to, to look at the topology of the cluster, which one is more, back, more backwards than another. So if at that time we use this kind of benchmark energies for the electron and the proton, you can see that as you move to higher energy, these two clusters go both in the backward region. So uh, we determine that basically, if you can discriminate them in the polar angle down to, to one degree, basically you can actually do a nice job still on, uh, on subtracting or, or minimizing the background from better height level. So this is what we consider the benchmark. Here you can see, about this beta height first suppression. Here is a simulation for what at that time we consider our top energy, which is uh, here the, the energy of the electron and the photon for the beta height and for the DVCS. Uh, you can see here that if you just put a cut at one GeV, you remove much of the beta height in the sample, but you don't touch uh, the DVCS from contribution to the sample. So this is a way that you can play to minimize the contribution from the beta height together with asking that the theta electron minus theta gamma is positive. Uh, after you do this, we studied actually the ratio of beta Heitler over total, which is beta Heitler plus the VCS, and you see that the beta Heitler never goes, in this we did in, in every single B in x t square and y, uh, it never goes above 60% uh, or so, but stays much below in, in many cases. So. This is not a problem of subtracting in the way I say the beta height, which is known to the 3% level. Uh, radiative corrections. So uh, we have events like this. You have DVCS and then you can have a, a photon, which is emitted by the electron before or after the interaction. Uh, let's say that after the interaction is less of a concern, or at least it wasn't a concern Terra, uh, because in one case, if you don't have enough magnetic field, the electron and the photon end up in the same cluster in the calorimeter and their energy is still correct. Or in another case, if they are separated, then you have three electromagnetic clusters and that doesn't pass the selection criteria for a DVCS measure. But it's certainly relevant in the initial state. Because in the initial state, most of the time, this photon goes collinear to the, to the electron and goes to the beam pipe. It's not detected. And in that case, one fakes the reconstruction of the kinematics. So he must evaluate uh, and correct for it. So here is a very, very rough study that we did at the time. So we plot in our Monte Carlo, there was the initial state radiation simulated. So we plot the energy of this uh, ISR uh, photon. This is done for lower energy and higher energy both. And, uh, and then we require actually, what if the photon has 2% at least of the energy of the coming electron, which is where actually the correction may become relevant. And you can see that only in uh, basically around 15%, if you do this ratio, all the times you have such a photon which uh, is really energetic. And this ratio, 15%, looks to be uh, constant, fairly constant in, uh, in X. So uh, there will be only, only a few percent of events, like let's say 15% of events where you have a significant emission. 
and, and that emission is still like uh, with low energy but a large tail. So in the end, you will be concerned by a five, six, seven percent or so events, and then you have to correct for this. We have Monte Carlo event by event correction or unfolding or whatever you call it. If, if this is a soft photon, then yes. what about soft photon radiation from the initial final proton? And if the soft photon is the proton, I don't think it's an issue at all. It's a, so usually the radiation it comes from the electrons, right? Okay. It's so low mass. The photon just sees the charge of the, of the, the, the thing that moves along. I mean, for that, for that purpose, this, this, the uh, structure and the mass are absolutely inessential. It must be negligible. Why? why, why is it this, is, this is why the, the, the book accelerators was broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they're ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you can actually, <laughs> yeah. actually circulate yeah. the problem much it's longer than. Soft emission, which was in the well, I forgot the formula, but it's a very strong So it involves the mass. Yes. Okay. So if the the electron will be like. So, basically, and this is actually what you now see in the white paper often. It's like we did uh, the statistics evaluation. Uh, our benchmark at that time was 10 inverse pentobar, and you can see that you can populate about lower and higher energies, all the beams that we want to measure with DVCS. These are DVCS uh, simulations. And here is again our, uh, in this study, we consider it between 0.01 in Y and 0.8. That's our phase space. Uh, so here is a more detailed uh, description of what we used in the analysis. So we used, uh, in the first place, a Monte Carlo, which was developed by H1 people, uh, Laurent Favart, Schaeffer, and so on. And they trained this on the HERA data. Why we use this uh, Monte Carlo? Because it's the only one in the market that is actually based on GPDs models. So we can kind of play of, uh, on something that was generated out of Compton for factor and et etc. is not a parameterization. And uh, then we apply this selection criteria for T, for Y. Uh, we consider uh, our acceptance at the time between minus five and five. Maybe now we ballpark is 0.4.5 in considerability and so on. Uh, we, for the cross-section measurement, we also apply the beta height as rich uh, suppression criteria. Uh, the events were smeared according to the resolution that we expected, and uh, systematics again with 5% and so on. So, out of this, you have these figures that you see in the white paper again. So we did the cross-section measurements for all these pins, and we show as an example here, uh, something for Q square above between 10 and 20, so it was some 15 in Q square, and uh, for lower X and higher X. And you can see here how beautiful in each beam you can measure the differential cross section. And uh, here includes also the systematics as well as the experimental effects. So if one Fourier transform this, you can have the idea on the precision of the images that you have, because this is the partonic profiles. Especially if you have the acceptance in Roman pots down to a very large T, you can probe this region where you could expect ion clouds effect. So, one message, at least for the DVCS so here. <coughs> ion coordinate space image of the two pi on cut of the form factor. Okay. So, uh, can we compute it more independently from, from if the final dynamics? <laughs> so, if you mean that the large <laughs> beam is yeah. can be computed with the curl model? Yeah. Yes. And there are no curves out there, no trend cloud is the same. Yeah. I would say. Okay. No, I mean, it, 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 it was computed and it, it, it does not show up on this. Uh, what you see is the uh, no, but uh, here certainly you don't see such an effect. It wasn't in the simulation. It wasn't in the simulation in the first place. Yeah, okay. Okay. it's it like, go down. Yeah. You probably can compute uh, in, 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 in the Carol to which you see this. Uh, you know, since the table very largely, right? Uh, what what you can compute, uh, as you say, is the. Uh, the, the, the Pardon 
densities or the charge densities at D of the order of the inverse pion mass. Yeah. And then you can fully transform that and look at what that does. To but, but it's not the pion cloud effect, it's just, just it's a <laughs> calculation on the GPD. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's just terminology. terminology. But then if you do the Fourier, look at what that does for your oh. slope. It's, yeah. a, it's a very tiny contribution to the slope, yeah. very close to zero, which you, which you don't see on this. Yeah. Uh, That's right. Uh, this uh, plot. So there are other ways to measure, um, say, the peripheral chiral structure of the nucleon in a high energy scattering way. You knock out the pion and observe it in the final state, and then there you have much bigger series. But, uh, uh, okay, so uh, a way that we s that we show sometimes to, 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 to show how important is actually the detector of EAC is that we are really challenged by systematics here. And here is a way to see. So if we consider, and of course we can play with other ballpark systematics, but if we consider our 5% systematics, and here we even scale down the benchmark luminosity to four in the Spiegel burn. Here what we plot is the ratio of the statistical uncertainty over the total one. So it's statistical systematics in quadrature. And you can see that basically it's always below 1% the statistical uncertainty or 10% if you go up in Q square up to 100. You really have to go uh, up to the moon in Q square to, to, to see that you are challenged statistically. Uh, so this is really, 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 really important at the EAC to control the system. So this is where, of course, if I change from 5% to 4% or 3%, it will change the game. So it's the systematics that we have to control for the DVCS measure. Okay, so, uh, what, is, what is the cross-section? This is the differential cross-section. That's the differential cross-section, yes, as a function of T. Stage? This is T. No, T. no, below in the, in the first row. Here? Yes. B. The impact parameter. So this is the uh, Fourier transform in the impact parameter of space, which is what you then use. Of course, this is not out of a uh, GPD extraction, it's just Fourier transform in the, the differential cross section. I think actually that this plot, I, mean, I don't want to interrupt you, but this plot is extremely over optimistic yeah. because, because uh, in order to, there is this huge, huge problem how to go to size zero. The only way you can, how can you do it is to trace the two square dependence. There's no, if you have really no other results, there's just no way to go from psi, from x equal to psi to, to psi equal to the no way. For the GPS. So that means extreme. that you will need extremely precise data also to be able to use, I mean, imagine you have, I don't know, a, a very high order perturbative collision, still you will very precise data to trace this, this dependence. Otherwise, it will be 100% dependent on the models. That would be the problem. So, and this is a difficult issue to, to, to investigate. And that's right. Do it here. That's right. But that is a at, at, at small x, you can go between the, the, the diagonal and the, the skewed distribution. Yeah. 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 But not at the x order. Also, if you assume that the assumption is exponential, it's correct. I think even there, actually, you can... No, even, even there, it's challenging. You, we yeah, also yeah. try with dipole dependence, you know. It's, it, it you dipole can play around, of course. Unless yeah. you have extremely yeah, high... So for, for, for x below 10 to the minus 2, this is observation based on why if we uh, uh, it's Vienna, that uh, um, it should be safe. Okay, I think, okay, it's really I said, uh, my understanding was that uh, Maxim Polikov had some general argument it is also not doesn't hurt the small x, but I'm not sure. Yeah. For large x, it, uh, I know that it's for large x, it's you're absolutely right. So it, it's a very delicate issue. You will need very precise data to be able to trace it, these things. So, yeah. Matched by very high order perturbative. Of course. No, wait, really this is just to make the argument that just, how yeah. precisely are the data that if yeah, you return form it, you have, but then this is not the GPDs, of course, you have to, yeah, yeah. So we, we agree totally, yeah. So another thing we saw is how precisely we can do like Rosenblut kind of separation. So at different energy, this shows like the uh, cross section of DVCS over the total cross section, where total means DVCS, the amplitude is a sum of DVCS square plus by the square, square plus the interaction term. And we can do it precisely also with an EAC if we have a, like you can scan it to different energies at least. Uh, and also remarkable is how we can measure AOT that again is the way to access GPDE and the, and the spin decomposition 
through like evaluating the orbital, the total orbital angular momentum through the GSAM rule. And uh, here is what we get again in a single bin of x and q square versus phi. This is the AUT asymmetry for uh, large energy and lower energy. Uh, you can see that everything looks around zero because basically we didn't have prediction in our Monte Carlo at that time and we don't have it nowadays. So, uh, but you can just, you are interested basically here on seeing how tiny the error bars are. And here you can compare it to different assumptions. So it's like, th that will be, whatever it will be, it will be a precise measurement of AUT. That's the argument. And here was the first attempt, and of course, it depends on the model we use, that it's the uh, Kreschos and Dieter's model, uh, uh, an extraction of the GPDs themselves. So what is the game we played here is that we took all this mock data that we had analyzed for the EAC and put together with the world data and do a, a global fit with the world data without and with the EAC. So here you can see the GPDH for the SIPWORKS, without any AC in purple and with the AC in, uh, in, uh, in, in orange. And if you can see the scale, this is a, a significant improvement. You can also have the AC, uh, the, the GPDE for SIPWORKS with the AC. It was unconstrained in that model if we just take the world data. And we also have a significant improvement on the GPDH for the blue ones. This is the, these are the Fourier transform of the GPDs, and then, of course, you can get these nice pictures that you can see in the white paper, white paper and around, which is the tomography in the impact parameter space. Here, for example, this shift is due to the GPDE contribution, for instance. So this is actually uh, what we have done. And of course, this is based on one model alone. It, it could be nice to, to, to see how model dependent is if we can play around with new development of this model and also other models in the market. And uh, what we didn't do yet is to include Mesons, for instance. So, uh, for instance, I think that this will drastically improve if we include JPSI data. And we can also extract GPDE for the blue ones as well, for the new measuring JPSI, and we can separate the flavors. So, everything is still uh, like something that is uh, left to evaluate. So what is the total limit? Yes. Is that really true that we have a in, in, in due to the GPDE yes. for polarized C-core in an unpolarized proton? Mm -hmm. But this is E-bar transfers what you need for that shape. E, e affects the density for in a polarized proton. Unpolarized quotes. This is a polarized proton. Yes. Polarized yes, 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 yes. This is out of AUT measurement. Yes. The sequence are then unpolarized, right? If you have the GPDE. Okay. If it's E, then it's. And this combination of, of the Fourier transform of H. And the Fourier transform of E gives you the density of unpolarized quarks in a polarized order. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, from the thing. Ah, 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 so sorry, sorry, now I get it. it's this that puzzles yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yes. Okay, got it. Yes, no, right. Polarized polarized proton. So unpolarized, yeah, okay, yes, correct. So uh, move, moving on from there, of course, we, we always say that, you know, measuring mesons, like a combination of mesons will separate the flavors because now we are flavor blind in this model, right? Fitting DVCS alone, JPSI gives access to gluons and so on. So uh, this is something that we want to evaluate. We actually measured, uh, like did an evaluation on the precision to which we can measure JPSI, and this is in the white paper, uh, at an EIC. And you can do a precise job. What we didn't do is an impact study for the GPD. So this is what you see in the white paper. We did the same as for the DVCS, 
And this is an example for a beam at lower and higher energy at lower and higher extent. And here is what you have as uncertainty in the Fourier transform. Uh, and recently I saw in uh, at the collaboration meeting that Temple Group, uh, Zenedine and others, did also the same for the Y1s. So the Y1s also gives you the gluon probe and also it's nice if you have this measurement together with the JPSI kinds of set, set, set test on the universality. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, considers a benchmark now of 100 inverse Fentoban because the cross section is lower for the Upsilon, especially at this kind of energy that was considered here, which is now the benchmark energy for the ESA. The Upsilon exploit in Psi in general has to be large. So yeah. Keep in mind with so the, the earlier objection regarding how to go from the skewed to the diagonal case, it really becomes acute in the um, in the case of the Upsilon. Yeah. So these were the, the pins that were, were assumed in uh, Q <laughs> square plus M square of the Upsilon, which is the always in this in the hard region. So we actually did a, a workshop on all this Mason business recently with also Christian running it and uh, there were a couple of people uh, Peter was there and you know we, we discussed about this because actually the problem is right now that a few people Kresho for instance Peter uh, they are doing this kind of fits uh, but we want some framework that propagates I don't know the knowledge at least in the future or projected in 10 years by now where the EAC is coming to play and we actually want a system which is actually giving us users the opportunity to, to do like tests fits with different models and see the model dependence of what we want to probe. This, is, this could be a powerful tool. So we are now thinking about you know, putting them in a framework which is called Parton or any other framework, but something that enables us, the users, to, to do easily do the fits uh, and, and, and get like at least a rough answer on what we want to probe and model dependencies and so on. And also to propagate again the knowledge because we don't want to build the ESC, which is built as a gluon microscope. And then we discover that the know-how on, uh, on the imaging is lost somehow in, uh, in 10, 15 years by now. So this is the, conclude, the list of conclusion of that workshop. And I just stress about that Mason production could become essential tool for uh, the GPSD studies at the ESC. So there is a dedicated community although small but dedicated and there is uh, the next level impacts are still to come and uh, we have this workshop this framework which is the parton project from mutard and others that can be also set as a as a platform for doing this um, in an ex fitter way kind of style okay couple of words uh, back to the experimental part uh, on the Roman post spectrometer, this is actually what we use at HERA to, 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 to basically be sure that we have uh, a diffractive event without any background. So we measure the XL variable, which is PL prime over the, the momentum of the beam. And at the diffractive event, we have this nice peak at one. So you select that peak, you have basically diffractive events and you don't have proton dissociation background, nor you have the systematics associated with. And again, systematics will dominate at any NC. So both facilities, BNL and uh, JLab, are uh, struggling on uh, having like the best like, forward acceptance for what forward protons that you can have. Here there is a quick study that we did to show the impact that if you lose something in the T acceptance of this forward spectrometer, for instance, if you lose the uh, lower part a little bit of the T acceptance, then when you Fourier transform, you blow up basically the uncertainty in the Fourier transformation. And if you lose the higher part, then basically you blow up the lower impact parameter. So it's really crucial that we have close to 100% uh, spectrometer that covers a large portion of T. And this is how BNL is addressing the problem. And I don't want maybe to go into details and, uh, unless you ask. And this is how JLab is also struggling with it. So it's like, uh, it's, it's a study that we are doing now to, to be sure that we can do this right. Uh, before I conclude, like a few uh, 
words on the nuclear because uh, we don't talk about this much but like we we need to it's nice it could be nice to have the gpg studies for nuclei as well because as we do for the pdfs the nuclear effects should be evaluated with for the gpds as well so one would uh, think of doing this uh, in ea uh, me measuring like exclusive processes as well like mesons and here we did back in time some couple of rough um, simulations using SARP in uh, eGold uh, and producing JPSI and PHI. Uh, this shows a comparison between the coherent cross section, which is this bumpy one, and the incoherent where the nucleus breaks up, which is the, the straight line one. And you can you can actually do an imaging using using these mesons, but you know, since we are talking about nuclei, so dense nuclear environment, if we are, if the saturation scale is within our grasp, we can also study uh, kind of the transition into it. Uh, for instance, one powerful tool is to use the phi meson, and here you can see in this model uh, the PSAT model. The PSAT model, this the blue includes the saturation effect, and the white includes no saturation effect. You can see the difference, and in, in that case, you, you should have an idea if you see or not some saturation effects or transition into saturation. And we need to put in any twist with the shadow That's into, us. into the theory. Yes. Actually, uh, given what is now established or, or, or seen in the shadow in ultra-peripheral collisions, we, we would say that what you really measure here is the, the, the thickness dependent dependence of uh, the increased nuclear shadowing as a function of the, of the impact. That's right. I mean, the, the measurement is certainly interesting, but the, 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 well, it's not, the, of course, the it's interpretation is, uh, um, say, it has to be put on a broader basis. So, yeah, uh, then couple of words about the detector you know, of course to do this business you want something which is really hermetic so something which covers some pseudo rapidity now ballpark is between minus 4.5 and 5 with an equal coverage of tracker and electromagnetic calorimetry uh, then you as i say then stressed you want a nice forward spectrometer and if you want to do this uh, gain with the nuclei then you have to veto the, the breakup using like uh, zero degree calorimetry or something like that in the forward region. So you need that too uh, in your detector and so on. So if you want to cross check with the rapidity gap method, you need certainly a good hadronic calorimeter in the forward region and other stuff that, you know, precise measurement requires also high resolution tracker and so on. Uh, so just here is a summary a little bit there, but I want to stress that we did uh, this impact parameter, this um, impact studies uh, with this yes, back in the past, but I think that is now mature the time to redo this in a proper way, perhaps with a full gene simulation, perhaps by adding mesons, and this is also a challenge for the theorists to, to, to develop something that works in a global fit with DVCS mesons together at the next leading order that we can use for evaluate these capabilities uh, of an ESC. I think for who has on production, one needs to do a little bit more exploratory studies because, for example, we published a couple of years ago uh, a latest result for the Thorobeson distribution amplitude. There was just basically no details from this community. But uh, <laughs> this is the question is uh, what, what you actually need. You know, we can get uh, this uh, A2, which is secondary about deficient with, with some accuracy, let's say 20 30 percent. Is it enough or it is not enough? This study has never been done. Do you need, do, do you need something really young and too? I don't know. I mean, we, we will have a, a whole day before the Maison production on Wednesday. And I suggest yeah. that we, um, we come back to this. Because I think so so my problem is that we have a very large annual correction school. Yeah, and that is a much bigger problem. That's really the issue. Yes. Um, it's good to find a, a theoretical description next to me the order that would allow you to 
plug the same. But the vertical description yeah. exists. It's just if you have large corrections, uh, you have large corrections. Yes. You can't find anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that is also a way to estimate what actually the experiment <laughs> buys to you, because then we can. It's easy to do a propaganda speech and say, like, you know, we do the EIC where everything is beautiful yeah, and we know. want a super microscope. But then, then we take the data and nobody cares. It's, it's, it will be a failure somehow. So we, 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 really, we really need to be sure that we assess. Well, that's you know, what I'm saying. What <laughs> <we do. laughs> yeah, but in some cases, you need the data. Yeah, but data, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a so it's the chicken and the egg. Right? You cannot say that, <laughs> you cannot say because we have the model, but I shouldn't take the data. So it's a little bit careful. Like, like, no, 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 no. I would just. Uh, I had a very modest moment. I said, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we need. We need to know. We need a, a certain point to have an idea if we have the model. But we, we, what kind of precision data you need? What kind of data? Or how, how actually you know the data will feed into the model? But there's some at least rough idea that gives us, you know, a guide, at least. So you know, we, we heard a lot about the, the JLab 12, uh, the JLab 6 and 12 GE exclusive processes data this morning. Um, if you imagine, um, imagine we had the EIC, say, at, um, 70 or 100 uh, GE square root of S, and um, we wanted to do exclusive measures measurements in a region that is like maximally close to the fixed target so to have kinematic overlap what what would be the main limiting factor so is what what um just ah. a, a experiment is, is it your energy resolution and, and why so uh, i mean what what prevents you from um going down in this kinematic triangle uh, nothing, I guess, the, the machine energy. <laughs> so no, there, there is no, there is not, there is not an experiment. So okay, if you if you give me a twenty GB machine, we overlap in that region, right? So uh, usually it's like uh, that the expect the, the resolutions in, in, in X and so they deteriorate with like one over Y. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That, that is like how, uh, but. A good, you know, good calorimeter or tracker mm -hmm. nowadays can do a decent job. Also, also that. Of course, if you the higher is the energy, you have advantages of like resolution plus uh, less with the height vary in the way. Yeah. But no, I, I'm not talking uh, about the, but, yeah, the being merits used. of doing measurements at high energy. I'm, I'm asking uh, um, really, um, kinematic overlap. For cross normalization, for direct comparison of data to data to extract some amplitude to some excuse score point, you want to. I, I don't see. I don't see a, a, a real experimental challenge. But what you measure, what you mentioned, that you know you have a little less resolution. But I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, honestly, it's like. But yeah, this is just helping you, like as a cross check with the amazing job that already JLab does, right? Because you will not compete with JLab 11 with an EAC. They have a higher luminosity. Yeah. In, in, um, it's like, I think, I mean, personally, I'm more intrigued on overlapping in Terra, where the, you know, the measurements were challenged in the, systematically and in the, statistically. In the independent parts of the cross sections, don't you have some like depolarization factors that are proportional to Y? That would be um, just very small to go down wide, so that uh, means it would be very difficult to measure spin asymmetry. We know that's the case in inclusive spin structure. So, uh, like say the a, the a parallel um, differs from g1 over f1 by a factor which which really is proportional to y. So you, I mean. You do that measurement at y of 0.01, then your your um, your spin modulated part of the cross section will be at most one percent of the total. No, no, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware of um, you know. Is this? Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware how deep is the overlap because I didn't I, I didn't try to overlap like this with some 20 inverse 20 GeV like central mass energy. But 
Are you sure you have to be really close to 0.01 or one? No, I'm just. I'm you have just some overlap. The limiting factors. I mean, <laughs> you you may certainly have some overlap there mm -hmm. uh, if you have enough flow and central mass energy in a safe region. It's more. It's more that. Yeah, you know, Daria mentioned that it's super important. Is it important? So it's like. Uh, Something that so you want to redo these measurements of JLab to 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 do like. I'm not sure it's system. super important, but I, uh, I think it's it's But doable if I think it's doable, I mean it's like certainly doable. It's, it will be not the same precision that you do already at JLab, so it will not publish in PRL. I don't know. <laughs> it's doable. I, I I find more attractive like overlapping. Here, because you know, you you you, you do, at Hera you need an a significant improvement of the, the, the measurements. At JLab eleven, you do a nice job right now. So, and you have different experiments, so you can cross check already, right? Yeah, the cross check is so, not a But certainly, it's something that you can do. <coughs> So one thing of course luminosity also we switch off to the and TSC. Like I mean you wouldn't want to repeat the measurement at 12 two because of luminosity and TSC would be very different. Yeah. So, so there's no point really that, that is my that is yes, right. yes. Yeah. So it's it's already done beautifully at J Lab eleven and it's with a higher luminosity and everything. But you can do it. But the yeah. thing is the other thing is like anything which you already mentioned, like energy dependent anything. Like for mesons it's more yeah. prominent than here maybe. But um, energy dependent uh, separations you couldn't really do at ASC easily because just uh, probably the, the, the virtual photon yes, separation yes, metal yes. production is basically the same. Um, so that could have an impact. But there's other techniques we can use. So, in some sense, these cross checks are useful to do. But how much you need to overlap is a different question. Uh, you can cross check in that ESO region that you can safely overlap with the movement, then you can trust. So, so yeah, we don't have to overlap with the whole region. No, but it's interesting to, to be at yeah. be at the lower energy yeah. region. I totally agree, absolutely. For this, for this. Um, otherwise, you could just measure at the, all the way on the left there, and all the way on the right, and you don't care about the middle. No, no, it's in the middle. Actually, it's it's yeah. a nice uh, transition region, yeah, which yeah. is because so, so. I, I remember today, like you know, Christian asked if you asked. Okay, so if you just does a quick assumption for the large X and it's the low X and vice versa, but EAC will challenge you to do actually the full transition in the phase space. So you will deliver data that said certainly will be challenging to, to describe. <laughs> <coughs> You mentioned that uh, at AIC you can do uh, the back to the loops in production. These are measures. You can help uh, move into large X region. Uh, for J side, as we heard, there are some issues. Uh, what kind of kinematic range of J side you can measure in terms of momentum? J side, I said. The J side. J side, yes. Upsilon seems to be more constant in the X region. J side, you can touch the more smaller X, but what if I require J side sample to have certain momentum? And I try to contest the transition from the lower X to the medium X. So, what kind of coverage of J side? The transition from, from what sort of? No, from the small X to the medium X. No. Oh, yeah. So, by, by looking for momentum in J side, so to reach it, I don't recall like the acceptance for the momentum which is psi, but I think if you have an automatic detector, you can use either the, the electron channel or the muon channel, and it goes down to the momentum that you can uh, measure for these uh, low momentum uh, leptons, right? Which mm -hmm. would be good if you use a TPC control detector or or whatever else is considered for the UAC. So I, I, I think you can do a good job there on, uh, on measuring the JPSI momentum or reconstructing the JPSI. Yeah, because 
you can you can you can take you can catch these leptons wherever they go in a in considerability and uh, in phi. So not I'm not aware of it or of any problem on measuring or reconstructing the jerk sign. Yeah, actually large moment just uh, how if you near too near the threshold. The large momentum just high will be less of a problem for sure. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So that's good. So in the JPSI simulations that you showed, did you assume that you have a muon detection? Oh right, no. Um, that that is only assuming electron and if you if you have muons you buy another factor too. And uh, I know that uh, JLab design has me on ID, so in that case you can. You know. It depends on now it goes down on which detector you uh, you assume. Uh, at that time when we did this study, it was like again 2013. We didn't consider muons, but it, 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 that doesn't mean that you need like a, a full-fledged muon spectrometer. You need muon ID, and you still measure the muon momentum in central track. But you know that those are muons, and it's also. There was actually in our workshop, like uh, at Stony Brook, a talk from uh, Julia for later. They showed actually what is the nice gain that you have if you actually use muons over the background. So again, systematics you have to control. I am all in favor of muon ID for this game also of making a precision measurement and controlling the systematics better. <laughs> so when you when you know that you have muons and you know that you have muons, you can do a more Precise measurement, and then you can do the rest with the electrons. Um, I wanted to comment on the uh, GPD impact studies on this slide. This is 21. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, I mean, these plots actually almost undersell the, the, the real impact of the EIC because. Um, what, what you claim here as knowledge of the uh, of the GPDs based on the present data is it, it is extremely say, model dependent and, and uh, it's based on untested assumptions about the reaction mechanism, which, which are difficult to quantify. They don't go into some error bar; they go more into some like, general doubt about this. And um, um, one That's major maybe. thing that will happen with the EIC is that we can test the reaction mechanism in. <laughs> In much more detail and establish more confidence about that's uh, my fear too, and this is why things I like, try like to higher twist them. corrections, uh, um, the, the validity of the factorized description, and so on. And um, I mean, what, what you show here about the, uh, the existing knowledge of the sequel GPDs is uh, it's, it's, it's like almost fantastic based on the present data, and it's not yeah, it, it's it's just, just an assumption. I mean, it's, it's, this is a model yeah. that was used, only uh, fitted only to Kara data. It's the simplest possible model, and so this is just uh, as a it was more than it was not worth it. I absolutely understand, and, and uh, I'm absolutely sympathetic to doing these studies. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, uh, it um, taken out of context, such a plot yeah. almost like undersells yeah, I don't want the EIC. Yeah. It's it's a, the first, you mean the first one, right? It's an yeah. an anti, anti propaganda plot. <laughs> 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 it's, like, uh, all right. it's an alternative. It's an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> so then it goes basically to what we call the bias, right? So how how much it's like changing between one model and another, and this is actually what it could be nice to vary, or even even with a newer version of Cresol or you know, like to add to other models and see how actually this varies because that will give me the bias that is actually linked to the model. So when I show it to someone else that is not an expert in the field, I say, yeah, this is super precise, but watch out. This is the model and if I fit other models, this is how it varies and it shows you that actually, well, you know, since the data were then like kind of like fit with one single model, I don't know. This analysis was based on leading model. Sorry, huh? this is, was based on leading model. Uh, no, 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 no. It's okay. next. Uh, it is a no. That's a good one. Uh, I, I mean, certainly it could have been done also beyond leading order, but I think it was leading order, right? All of this. Uh, I'm not one. sure now because uh, this here data yeah. could have been done. Uh, could have been done also leading order and the next to leading order. It works correct. 
I think so. Okay. I uh, think this was an NLO. Do you remember? No? He, he was an NLO? I'm not sure. <laughs> you did the fit. You, did, you, you heard the math. No, no, we have to go. I know the fit is going to be part of what the leading order of next leading order. Okay, we, we had to open the paper again. Who wants to be able to? No, actually, I wanted to say that if it is analog, then many analog is different. Models is also easy. Computer, it's kind of a loose sort of Senator, uh, one question regarding QD effects. You mentioned earlier that you said the dom dominant system, the uncertainty in the beta hyper is knowledge of the program form factor. This is my understanding. Yeah. You can correct is, me. Isn't and it um, on QED radiative corrections generally much larger than that? I would imagine. The no, I it's like the, the, the QED, yeah. So um, what I mentioned, what I mentioned, like the pattern for factor as a as a source of like lack of knowledge on the in the beta height cross section, right? You mean you, you take the leading order QD mm -hmm. cross section and uh, so what is limiting that cross section? The, the only thing that's limiting it is the uh, is the program. Form. Yeah, that Otherwise is what I'm just yeah. um, number. But, um, but I mean overall. I would imagine that the um, um, uncertainty from higher order electromagnetic corrections is much larger than any um, program form factor effect in the, in the beta hyper, isn't it? In the cross section? In the, yeah. Or the beta hyper when. I mean, so, in, in, um, suppose there, were, there, there was no DVCS, but there was. Only beta so yeah, this question is how much uh, how much you can uh, you can you can predict the beta height there nowadays. What is the main in the cross section? Okay, so yeah. if I want to describe a beta height there cross section, what is the lead limiting factor right now? Because it's a very well known process, and my understanding was that this two three percent of uncertainty, theoretical uncertainty, comes mainly on the proton form factor. Uh, that is my understanding. I'm not an expert. Can you some sureness of the problem as well? Not in the beta either. Any uh, other question sure. uh, regarding small edge hierarchy in the markets to be assembled uh, here with some experimentalists? What about effects of QCD evolution? Um, have they, can, can we say that they have been seen in the HERA? Have, have they been seen in the HERA DBCS data? So. That, 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 yeah. yeah, sure, sure. I mean, we, we have to uh, really implement the evolution to get it right. Right. Yeah, there was this this plus from Hera that have like have done a different Q yeah. so squares, right? So you have you to see them in what observable mainly the, the W dependence or um, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, really uh, starting from a large X GPD mm -hmm. uh, and, and evolving it down to Hera. Then you certainly you need evolution yeah. just by construction. <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking about. Um, looking at the data over the kinematic range at HERA, and then um, are there any phenomena or any quantities that, that directly attest to evolution? Like we have an inclusive scattering. Yeah, yeah. We, we have to divide FL, FL, we like have the double independence yeah. of FL, no, no. F is exponent, the changes in Q squared. Yeah. Yeah. Suppose so. It's reckoned pinpoint now the plot itself. Show it with the same with the same clarity that gets you get from inclusive data. Yeah. 
that, so it's only indirectly. But the delta exponent also shows, you know. I think so. Yeah. So. Has anyone measured the what's called like effective regurgit or effective trajectories for DVCS that the, the, the exponent of the W dependence as a function of Q square? See whether that changes with Q square. I think I remember there was some issue with the effective tra regular trajectory for DVCS compared with the other methods that was like uh, an alpha. Uh, which was different from all the other methods, which was 1.5 instead of 2, I don't remember. At certain point I had like all these collective plots somewhere. I can look at it. Yeah, you know, we never did this effective W exponent, we just did the evolution itself properly. Right? Uh, yeah, I can't kind of expect the answer is yes, but I can't really mm -hmm. know pinpoint the what you see. That's what think about it. How do you determine Q square in the GPD Sorry? How do you determine the Q square in the GPD that you define? What's is it just equal to the Q square of the single mass of the entity? Because the evolution is in the is it all the Q square is which is the Q square is the Q square. So you are saying that the Q square is the GDP is equal to the to the Q square of the photon. 